Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Harindra Wijay Sundra. I'm the Vice President of Medical Devices at CADES. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today uh, for the CADES webinar. Uh, I'm pleased to say we have people tuning in for this session from across the country. I'm speaking to you today from CADES Toronto office, which I'd like to acknowledge is located on the traditional land of the Huron Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. For those of you who aren't familiar with CADIS, we are an independent, non-for-profit organization that provides decision makers at all levels of the healthcare system with objective evidence and expert advice they need to make informed decisions about the optimal use of drugs and medical devices. We do offer a variety of programs, including our webinar series, the CADIS Lecture Series, Evidence to Action, and the annual CADIS Symposium to really help connect decision makers with the relevant evidence. Today, uh, we are presenting this webinar in association with the Simon Fraser University, the Michael Smith Foundation for Health Research, and the Canadian Institutes for Health Research, and finally, Age Well. So today's topic is compliant flooring to prevent health uh, fall-related injuries. As many of you know, falls are a major issue in Canada, in particular for older adults. In 2014, the Public Health Agency of Canada reported that falls are the leading cause of injury-related hospitalization among Canadian seniors. To give context, between 20% and 30% of seniors fall each year, and the majority of these result in broken or fractured bones. Over a third of fall-related hospitalizations among seniors are associated with a hip fracture, with a cost of an average of $20,000 uh, to treat. Given that almost 30,000 people across Canada experience hip fractures every year, there is a significant financial cost not to mention the negative mental health and physical consequences for individuals related to falling, including depression and death. A great deal of research has been done by CADIS and other organizations on different aspects of falls and fall prevention in Canada. We've looked into hip protectors, nutritional supplements for the prevention of fractures due to falls, and fall prevention strategies, to name a few areas of research. And all of this is available on our website at www.cadis.ca. A rapid response report we did in 2010 on rubberized flooring in long-term care, clinical effectiveness and cost effectiveness, identified some research gaps that was the impetus for the work being presented today. Today, you're going to hear the results of recent scoping review that responds to the information needs of healthcare decision makers tasked with preventing fall-related injuries. You'll hear a summary of the evidence about compliant flooring as an intervention for preventing fall-related injuries in older adults. This information will be especially useful in the long-term care environment, but also applicable in the hospital, assisted living, and home care settings. I'm very uh, ha pleased to say we have two great speakers today. First is Dr. Don McKay, who is an associate professor in the Department of Biomedical Physiology and Kinesiology at Simon Fraser University in Burnaby, British Columbia. She's a core member of the University of British Columbia's Center for Hip Health and Mobility, and she holds a scholar award from the Michael Smith Foundation for Health Research. Our second speaker is Dr. Chantal Lachance, a postdoctoral fellow in the Knowledge Translation Program at St. Michael's Hospital here in Toronto, Ontario, and is a trainee with the Drug Safety and Effectiveness Cross-Disciplinary Training Program. Just before we get in underway, I wanted to let you know that our speakers will be accepting questions once both presentations have been made. The Q&A session will be moderated by Anne Vasilla, uh, CADIS Liaison Officer for British Columbia, and you can email your questions at any time to events at cadis.ca. And now I'll turn things over to Dr. McKay and Dr. Lachance. Okay, well, thank you so much for the introduction, Harindra. This is Dr. Mackey um, speaking to you today from Burnaby, British Columbia. Uh, I thank all of you for joining us. Chantelle and I are delighted to be able to speak today about the scoping review that we completed on compliant flooring. This project was funded through a knowledge synthesis grant from the Canadian Institutes of Health Research, and it also formed one chapter of Chantelle's PhD thesis. Chantelle and I are presenting today on behalf of our entire research team, which also included professors Stephen Rabinovich and Fabio Feldman from Simon Fraser University, Professor Andrew Lang from the University of Waterloo, Anya Demars, our librarian, and Michael Jerkowski, our research assistant. 
As Harindra mentioned in his introductory remarks, um, and as I'm sure most of you will appreciate, falls and related injuries among older adults are a major public health concern. They're the leading cause uh, of injury-related hospitalization and death among older adults, and they cause approximately 95% of all hip fractures and 80% of all traumatic brain injuries in the older adult population. And falls and related injuries exert a tremendous economic burden on the Canadian healthcare system, amounting to approximately $3.4 billion in direct costs each year. In the community setting, 30% uh, of older adults fall at least once per year, and 10 to 15% of these falls result in injury. In the long-term care setting, the risks are much higher, and falls and related injuries occur at rates that are two to three times higher than seen in the community, which suggests a particular need for intervention in the long-term care setting. So to this end, in 2015, Osteoporosis Canada published recommendations for preventing fracture in long-term care. And they did this based on systematically reviewed evidence. These recommendations covered the use of hip protectors, vitamin D and calcium, osteoporosis medications, exercise, and multifactorial interventions, which involve combinations of intervention strategies. These recommendations are a very important step toward protect protecting residents from fracture. They do not, however, address other common types of fall-related injuries, such as traumatic brain injuries, lacerations, and contusions. In addition, each of the recommended strategies requires some degree of active user adherence from either residents or staff or both. So for the past number of years, our research group has been studying an intervention strategy called compliant flooring, which we define as flooring systems or floor coverings with some level of shock absorbency. And you might know compliant flooring by other names. It's also commonly referred to as safety flooring, shock absorbing flooring, and sometimes dual stiffness flooring. The idea is that a high degree of compliance, or in other words, a low level of stiffness in the flooring, will reduce the forces applied to the body parts at impact during a fall. Compliant flooring is considered to be a passive environmental intervention because once it's installed, it does not rely on active user adherence. Rather, it's present, ubiquitous, and available to all. Furthermore, unlike hip protectors, which protect specifically against hip fracture, Compliant flooring has the potential to reduce the frequency and severity of multiple types of fall-related injuries, including fractures, traumatic brain injuries, lacerations, and contusions. But very few long-term care sites or other healthcare centers have implemented compliant flooring systems. And from surveys that we've done with stakeholders, we've learned that an important barrier to the uptake of compliant flooring is a lack of synthesized evidence about key performance aspects of compliant flooring systems. As you can imagine, different stakeholders have different questions about compliant flooring. Most of them want to know if it works to prevent fall-related injuries. Some also care if it's a cost-effective intervention. In other words, will it save money in the long term? And others are concerned about the logistics of installing it in an existing buildings and possible effects it might have on staff. So against this backdrop, we set out to conduct a scoping review, which is a knowledge synthesis methodology, particularly suited for emerging areas where evidence exists from multiple disciplines, from a combination of published and unpublished work and often including a variety of different study designs. The research question we sought to address was, what is presented in the scientific literature about the biomechanical efficacy, clinical effectiveness, cost effectiveness, and workplace safety associated with compliant flooring systems that aim to prevent fall-related injuries? And our two specific objectives were to describe the extent range and nature of research activity in the area, and secondly, to identify gaps in the existing research and directions for future research about compliant flooring. And from the outset, we believed this scoping review would be particularly useful in long-term care 
but also applicable in other healthcare settings, including hospitals, assisted living, hospice, and home care environments. We formed a research advisory panel to consult with throughout the research process. This panel was comprised of knowledge users who were likely to use the knowledge generated from the review in order to make more informed decisions about health policies, health programs, and or health practices. Our panel included managers of fall and injury prevention from local health authorities, representatives from long-term care facilities management teams, researchers with content expertise, directors of care at long-term care homes, and a physiotherapist from a long-term care home. The panel was involved in developing the research question and key definitions integral to the review, providing feedback on the design and conduct of the review at project meetings, providing feedback on um, interpretation uh, of findings and research gaps, and also in helping to disseminate findings. For this review, compliant flooring was broadly defined as flooring systems or floor coverings with some level of shock absorbency. And our research team uh, had questions that were probing four thematic areas about compliant flooring deemed by our researchers and our advisory panel to be of high importance in decisions related to the uptake of compliant flooring in healthcare settings. And I'll briefly review these definitions now as we will refer to these terms throughout the rest of the presentation. So biomechanical efficacy refers to evidence from experiments conducted in controlled laboratory environments about impact force attenuation or energy absorption during real or simulated falls onto compliant flooring systems. It also includes uh, testing of balance, gait and mobility performance and or assistive device use on compliant flooring systems. Clinical effectiveness refers to evidence from research involving human participants and measurement of how compliant flooring systems affect falls and fall related injuries. Cost effectiveness relates to evidence about the costs of compliant flooring systems relative to their effects on fall related injury healthcare costs. And finally, workplace safety refers to evidence about the effects of compliant flooring systems on musculoskeletal health and fatigue of healthcare workers as a direct result of differences in floor compliance. I'll just mention at this point in time that if you're interested in further details about our review methodology beyond what we speak about today, uh, they are published in the Brit British Medical Journal Open. The article is freely available and can be easily found uh, by searching Google for scoping Lachance. So our methodology for this scoping review was adapted from the standard ARCC and O'Malley framework for conducting scoping reviews, and we incorporated recent recommendations for the improvement of the methodology from other research groups. We searched a number of different academic databases and sources of gray literature and initially identified nearly 5,000 records. Next, we screened titles and abstracts of about 3,600 records to identify those that met our inclusion criteria, meaning they investigated some type of compliant flooring system and at least one of the four themes of interest. This left 166 full text records that were again screened for eligibility and ultimately we included 140 records and we deemed 84 of these as main records. And it's these 84 records that we will speak about subsequently today. These 84 records were charted, meaning we collated and summarized and reported results from these records using both numerical and narrative analysis approaches that Chantel will describe in further detail. Over half of the 84 records were related to biomechanical efficacy. There were also a considerable number of records related to clinical effectiveness and workplace safety, and the theme with the fewest records was cost effectiveness. It's worth noting that in 2010, when CADETH published their rapid response report on rubberized flooring, there were no studies identified related to clinical effectiveness or cost effectiveness. Now, notwithstanding 
differences in the search strategies used by CADIS and by our research team, this certainly suggests that there's been considerable growth in the evidence related to clinical and cost effectiveness of compliant flooring over the past six or seven years. So at this point, I will hand the microphone over to Chantal and she will present the results and conclusions of the review. Thank you, Don. So I will be providing a detailed overview of our results. And in the case that you would like to revisit our findings after the webinar, or would like to know more details about our results, they have now been published in PLUS One and are freely available. To find the results article, you can perform the same Google search that Don provided um, by searching scoping Lachance. So we use numerical and narrative analysis to describe the extent, range, and nature of research activity. The numerical analysis mapped the records in terms of their summary information and methods, and we reported data as number and percentage of records. The narrative analysis summarized the evidence within each of our four themes, stratified according to the questions that our research team, including the research advisory panel, deemed pivotal to decision making around the uptake of compliant flooring. I will first be talking about our numerical analysis. So the majority of our records were identified through our original academic database search. Our original database searches retrieved 51 out of our 84 records, or 61%. This also means 39% of our records were retrieved from other search strategies, highlighting their importance. So aside from our academic database search, consultations with experts was our most fruitful technique for retrieving additional relevant records, followed by conference proceedings. Based on the Web of Science journal classifications, it is apparent that our academic records came from a wide range of journal categories. This suggests that compliant flooring is being investigated by multiple disciplines, from engineering to healthcare. All of our included records were published between 1981 and May 2016, which was our cutoff date for this review. When looking at this bar graph, you can see that the number of records produced per year increased steadily over time. 56% of all included records were published within the last 10 years. Early evidence on this topic primarily focused on carpets and padded underlays, but in the past decade, there has been more interest in purpose-designed novel compliant flooring systems. Records originated from several countries, but the majority of records were from Canada, the United States, and the UK. In fact, over 75% of the literature came from these three countries. Across all included records, we identified 183 unique flooring conditions that have been studied, which could cl be classified into four categories. Thick vinyl, which can be defined as vinyl with a thickness of over five millimeters. Carpet with no underlay, which can include flooring such as commercial grade carpet and carpet tile. Novel compliant flooring with no underlay or overlay, such as smart cell, sorba shock, and cradle. And the final category of flooring was combination flooring. This includes floorings with an overlay and an underlay, which were not purchased as a single flooring type. So an example of this could be smart cell underlay adhered to a vinyl overlay. So our narrative an analysis was driven by a research team, which included our research advisory panel. We asked this panel what questions they would want answered about compliant flooring. We then organized these questions based on theme. So for the first theme, biomechanical efficacy, the panel wanted to know what evidence exists from the experiments conducted in a controlled laboratory environment about impact force attenuation or energy absorption during real or simulated falls onto compliant flooring systems. Evidence of meaningful amounts of energy absorption and force attenuation exists specifically at the hip and head with 65% or most records having been conducted in laboratory settings using artificial surrogates. 
Researchers tested hip impacts for the potential link to hip fractures and found 20 records which provided details about the ability of compliant flooring to absorb energy and attenuate force in the event of an impact. For hip impacts, carpet without an underlay did not provide enough force attenuation to suggest it was protective against injury to the hip. However, Carpet with underlay, as well as novel compliant flooring with or without underlay, has been shown to reduce forces below the threshold for hip fracture. Researchers also tested head impacts for the potential link to traumatic brain injury and found that novel compliant flooring provides more protection than commercial carpet. Impact forces were 20 to 80% lower and the authors reported that the risk of a moderate head injury based on head injury criteria is five to 25% for head impact on non -com novel compliant flooring versus 80 to 90% risk on carpet. Researchers tested hand impacts for the potential link to wrist fractures and contrary to the other impact sites, no differences were found between carpet and standard flooring for hand impacts. The second question that the panel had for this theme was what evidence exists from experiments conducted in a controlled laboratory environment about balance, gait, and mobility performance on compliant flooring systems. 30 records considered how different types of compliant flooring may affect standing or walking balance. Overall, participants had limited difficulty in maintaining static or dynamic balance on carpet and novel compliant flooring. Overall, participants had limited difficulty mobilizing over compliant flooring, except for those who have a neurological dysfunction, in this case, Parkinson's patients. The final question the panel had for this theme was what evidence exists from the experiments in a controlled laboratory environment about assistive device use on compliant flooring systems? Eight records considered mobility use, specifically seven records looked at wheelchairs with carpet and two records explored walkers with novel compliant flooring. The effect of compliant flooring on propelling a wheelchair largely depended on the specific flooring type. So when focusing on carpet flooring, there was evidence to suggest that carpet increased rolling resistance, average work per meter, energy cost, and cardiopulmonary response. Other records reported that carpet did not affect manual proportion of wheelchairs in the lab or long-term care setting, and another record found that carpet resulted in less torque than other conditions. There were two records that also looked at compliant flooring with walker use and did not find evidence to suggest that it would affect the use of walkers. So the biomechanical efficacy theme had the largest number of records out of the four included themes and tested the greatest number of flooring conditions. Most of the impact testing was performed using surrogates, so um, rather than human participants, and found significant reductions in force. The force reductions were significant enough to suggest that compliant flooring is an injury prevention strategy worth exploring further uh, using human participants. And when considering both the impact testing as well as the standing and balance tests that have been conducted, there's a strong enough evidence to suggest that uh, clinical trials to test the clinical effectiveness of compliant flooring is warranted. So in terms of the gaps in the evidence, more research is warranted to examine the effects of compliant flooring on dynamic balance and gait performance during tasks of increased complexity. So an example of this is gait performance while conducting activities of daily living. In addition, most of the biomechanical records with human participants only included relatively young adults, or healthy community dwelling older adults to draw the conclusions about how compliant flooring may affect older adults in general. For example, only 20% or 10 records in this theme involved high risk older adults who were not living independently and only 16% or eight records examined special populations. So when possible, future studies should also consider using the population of interest and that would be older adults who are at risk of falling. Now the next thing we'll discuss is clinical effectiveness. 
The panel wanted to know what evidence exists from research involving human participants and measurement of how compliant flooring affects fall-related injuries. 14 records looked at this question. 11 records provided some evidence of injury reduction. Two records provided non-significant differences. In one record was a protocol for an ongoing randomized controlled trial and therefore did not have results. Three records provided statistical evidence that compliant flooring reduced the incidence of fall related injuries, which I will briefly describe. So the first study was a four year randomized uh, retrospective cohort study. It was conducted in an elderly unit of a hospital where they found 29% fewer injuries in older patients for, on carpet versus vinyl. So 17% of the falls on car car carpet resulted in injuries, where 46% of falls resulted in injury on vinyl. The second study was a two-year non-randomized controlled tr trial evaluating the effect of compliant flooring on fall-related injury reduction for females in a Swedish long-term care setting. They compared compliant flooring to standard flooring, and the flooring was installed in six resident rooms that was excluding bathrooms, a communal dining room, and parts of a hallway. After they adjusted for body mass index, compliant flooring significantly reduced the relative risk of injury in the event of a fall by 59% when compared to standard flooring. The third study to perform statistical testing was a two-year prospective cohort study in 34 long-term care sites. They examined different flooring types and estimated that the risk of breaking a hip in a fall would be reduced by up to 80% if carpet was laid on top of uncarpeted wooden floors. Now the remaining eight records suggesting a decrease in the incidence of fall related injuries were gray literature articles and only provided general statements of injury reduction, but did not report numerical values. I should also note that the study looking at Tarket Omnisport Excel that I have under no change, they did find that compliant flooring could result in a reduction of injury rates by up to 42%, but the results were not sig significant because of insufficient sample size. The panel was also interested in knowing what evidence exists from research involving human participants and measurement of how compliant flooring affects falls. We uncovered three records that perform statistical testing to examine whether compliant flooring increases the risk of falling in older adults. Two records, which describe studies conducted in a hospital, did not find evidence that compliant flooring alters the rate of falling. However, one record found an increase in the rate of falling on carpet, though the authors mentioned that these results were likely confounded by differences in exposure time. Now, due to the limited number of studies exploring this topic, and the variable results, future research is definitely needed to provide more conclusive evidence. So the clinical eff uh, effectiveness theme contained records which showed, though limited, evidence of compliant flooring reducing the incidence of fall-related injuries in hospital and long-term care. The number of fall-related injuries observed when in, within individual studies have been relatively uh, small, so it has precluded definitive conclusions. Therefore, we require evidence from longer clinical trials involving larger sample sizes. More research is needed to determine if certain brands of compliant flooring pose a risk for falls. And moreover, no clinical trials thus far have included, included in this review have um, discussed where to prioritize the installation of compliant flooring within either the long-term care site or a hospital ward. Yet this is a practical issue when uh, that knowledge users may encounter, especially when they're under financial constraints. So future research is needed to explore this. For the cost effectiveness theme, the panel was interested in knowing what evidence exists related to costs of compliant flooring systems relative to their effects on fall and fall related injury healthcare costs. Six records discuss the direct cost or incremental cost of purchasing and installing novel compliant flooring relative to standard flooring. Costs have been reported so far in the following brands, SmartCell, Softile, Tarket Omnisport Excel, Cradle, and Penn State Flooring. 
Acknowledging that the pricing of compliant flooring in these included records was reported using different currencies and over multiple years, we converted all of the costs to reflect 2015 US currency. The average absolute direct cost of purchasing and installing a novel compliant flooring system was 237 US dollars per square meter, ranging between $101 and $538 per square meter. The average incremental cost of purchasing and installing a novel compliant flooring system relative to standard flooring was 196 US dollars per square meter with a range between 50 and $511. We also found six records that provided cost effectiveness or payoff estimates related to compliant flooring. The two most extensive studies of cost effectiveness, which were peer reviewed, examined Tarket, Omnisport Excel, and Penn State flooring, and both suggested that compliant flooring may be cost effective. Specifically, the study examining Tarket Omnisport Excel found that the flooring is associated with the cost savings and a quality adjusted life year gains if the flooring does not increase faller rate. The Penn State flooring study estimated a payback period of 10 and a half years if only direct costs avoided were evaluated and approximately 11 months when direct and indirect costs were included. So most cost effectiveness records reported direct and incremental costs to purchase materials and install compliant flooring. And based on these findings, we can report that compliant flooring does in fact cost more than standard flooring. As for the gaps, this research, uh, this theme had the fewest number of records. We suggest future research on compliant flooring includes more cost effectiveness studies that consider multiple injuries. So uh, thus far, a lot of the cost effectiveness studies included had only focused on hip fractures. Future re research may also want to consider costing out the differences between a retrofit versus a new build. Determ determining the cost of both situations would help knowledge users decide on which installation method may be most feasible. Um, as well, we may want to consider examining different types of compliant flooring to determine if certain brands are more cost effective than others. So the final theme was workplace safety and the research advisory panel were interested in knowing what evidence exists from the research about the effects of compliant flooring systems on musculoskeletal health and fatigue of healthcare workers as a direct result of differences in flooring compliance. When considering the potential benefits for healthcare workers, five records were included. A few records suggested that compliant flooring provides more comfort for hospital staff than standard. In addition, a 42 week cohort study found that carpet and compliant flooring reduced perceptions of fatigue due, uh, due to underfoot impact in hospital staff compared to control. As well, a non randomized control trial of 153 long term care staff observed the effects of installing a thick vinyl compared to a thin vinyl. And after a two-year follow-up, long-term care staff reported decreased pain intensity score in their feet. However, most of the workplace safety records reported some negative effects of compliant flooring on healthcare workers. Focus groups uh, revealed that compliant flooring increases subjective ratings of leg fatigue for long-term care work, uh, staff. Six records uh, noted increased subjective ratings of perceived fatigue when maneuvering equipment, including beds, wheelchairs, stretchers, and floor-based lifts over both carpet and novel compliant flooring in hospital and long-term care settings. Eight records revealed that carpet and novel compliant flooring increases the forces required to, to maneuver carts, beds, wheelchairs, as well as floor-based lifts. Now, when considering acceptable forces to maneuver equipment, three of the six records that examined carpet and two of the three records that examined novel compliant flooring records uh, values were actually over acceptable pushing forces, suggesting an increased risk for injury. Ensuring that the forces required to move equipment within acceptable limits is an essential part uh, to prevent injury. 
Um, as indicated by one record, which documented five adverse events from staff working on novel compliant flooring in a 16 month period, including one lower back strain while moving a patient on a trolley. So for the final theme, workplace safety, we retrieved the first available evidence of how compliant flooring may affect healthcare workers. And the evidence suggests that compliant flooring may pose safety risks for healthcare workers. Some records use subjective ratings to obtain perceptions, while other records objectively measured the outcomes of interest. In terms of gaps, more research is needed with larger sample sizes. Generally, the sample size was quite low in most studies of this theme. We also need studies that identify and test potential solutions to mitigate the increased effort for workers to maneuver equipment. An example of this could be investigating a motor driven or ceiling lift, as well as exploring the effects of wheel size, type and materials. We also require testing tasks that are common in the workplace, such as maneuvering equipment in confined spaces. When reflecting on the strengths of our scoping review methodology, we use a standardized approach to and search academic and gray literature. We also used a research advisory panel to provide consultations throughout study execution. Our review has limitations that are worthwhile noting. Common to scoping review methodology, our study provides breadth of understanding, but not necessarily depth. And our study did not assess risk of bias or rate the quality of evidence. In addition, the results reported in the records were based on specific flooring types and may not be generalizable to all floors. Despite these limitations, this is the first review of its kind to summarize evidence about compliant flooring as a potential intervention for preventing fall related injuries in older adults. And we also identified gaps in the evidence which point to new avenues for research. So I'd like to conclude our webinar with the following summary. Compliant flooring is a promising strategy for fall injury prevention from a bio biomechanical perspective. However, additional research is warranted to confirm whether compliant flooring prevents fall related injuries in real world settings, is a cost effective intervention strategy, and can be installed without negatively impacting workplace safety. In case any of our listeners are interested in any additional work that we have conducted related to compliant flooring, we have compiled a list of our publications here, which we can share with you after the, the webinar. And we'd like to express gratitude to our scoping review research team, our collaborators and knowledge users, members of our aging and population health lab, which Dr. Don Mackey leads at Simon Fraser University, our funding sources, as well as Cadith for hosting today's webinar. So if you'd like to get in touch with either Don or myself after the webinar, I have provided our email addresses as well as our research gate and Twitter handles. Um, and with that, um, Don and I would love to take any of your questions you may have. Thank you. Many thanks to speakers Dr. Don Mackey and Dr. Chantel Lachance for their excellent presentations. I'm Anne Volsilla, CADIS Liaison Officer for British Columbia, and I'm based in Victoria, BC. Now I will be facilitating the question and answer portion of this webinar. As a reminder, participants may email your questions at any time to events at cadis.ca during this portion of the webinar. This question is for Dr. Lachance. Dr. Lachance, your slide of references indicates that you have conducted a number of other studies on compliant flooring in addition to this scoping review. Could you briefly summarize these other studies? and what you have learned from them? 
Uh, great. Th thanks, Anne. Um, yeah, so um, the scoping review that we presented was actually the first chapter of my PhD dissertation, as, as Don said earlier. Um, so this review uh, really launched uh, a few other projects related to compliant flooring. Um, the first was an ergonomic evaluation. So we wanted to decide, uh, determine what the effects of compliant flooring were uh, by and also exploring floor-based lifts to see what force is required to push long-term care residents. Um, so for that study, we found that compliant flooring does increase forces when compared to concrete flooring. However, the use of a motor-driven floor-based lift substantially reduced the force requirements, um, and that would be compared to a traditional floor-based lift. Um, so generally speaking, our conclusions were that if you were to consider compliant flooring, um, however, um, or any type of flooring for that matter, motor-driven lifts may actually reduce the risk of work-related MSIs um, and, and may be need to, needed to be considered uh, when installing compliant flooring. Um, and then the other two studies that I did uh, during my PhD was an interview study with long-term care senior managers and then a stakeholder symposium where we included a variety of key knowledge users. So the interview study um, actually is in press right now and the stakeholder symposium findings were published uh, this month, um, actually last month because it's February, um, in the Canadian Journal on Aging. Um, and both the interview study and stakeholder symposium provided new evidence about important factors that stakeholders should consider when deciding to install compliant flooring in long-term care. So one of the big themes we found was that they needed more conclusive clinical effectiveness studies to make a decision on whether to install compliant flooring. And similar to our webinar, the stakeholder symposium helped disseminate knowledge about the current available evidence of compliant flooring to key stakeholders. And uh, aside from my PhD, I've been uh, heavily involved in a four-year randomized controlled trial, uh, which looked at compliant flooring. It's called the FLIP study. And we actually just finished outcome ascertainment August 2017, so a few months ago. And we are working to prepare and analyze the results now. Um, since Dawn is the lead of the study, maybe I'll let her uh, further elaborate elaborate on our flip trial? Great, thank, thanks Chantal. Yes, um, we are conducting um, a randomized control trial with a partner long-term care home uh, here in British Columbia where flooring renovations occurred in 150 resident bedrooms during the spring and summer of 2013 and roughly half of those rooms were randomly assigned to receive smart cells compliant flooring it's one inch thick, and the other half were randomly assigned to receive a standard control flooring, which was plywood. And all floors were covered with identical hospital grade vinyl so that they looked the same. And our research team monitored all falls and injuries in these resident bedrooms for four years, as Chantel said, up until the end of August 2017. And when the data analyses are completed from, from this study, we'll have a better understanding of the effects of compliant flooring on falls and fall-related injuries in the long-term care population in particular. Great, thank you. Uh, just another question that's just come in, which may actually be an, an addition to what you've just spoke about, um, but uh, the caller said, excellent presentation. Would you please talk a little about your current study on compliant flooring in the Vancouver long-term care facility? Okay, so yes, this is Don again. Um, yeah, that's the that question pertains to the the trial that is going on um, right now in British Columbia, the one that I just spoke about. So, as I said, we're in the stage of um, uh, data cleaning, data management, data analysis, and um, when results are available uh, f from that trial, we will uh, seek to disseminate those widely and and publish the results of those uh, of that study. So it's ongoing. Um, and, and we're all keen to, to find out the results of that. Excellent. Okay, this question is for Dr. Mackey. Dr. Mackey, is there enough evidence at this point in time to recommend installation of compliant flooring in long-term care homes or in other healthcare settings? 
Thanks, Anne. Um, well, from the, the stakeholder engagement that we've been involved with over the past couple of years that Chantel spoke about just a few minutes ago, we've heard that the stakeholders are quite interested in adopting compliant flooring, particularly in long-term care, if, and this is contingent on it being effective, because they want an intervention that will protect residents. Um, and they were, they've even expressed to us that they're committed to figuring out ways to address some of the workplace safety issues in order to keep staff safe at the same time as keeping residents safe. But at this point in time, uh, as Chantel spoke about in terms of the results from this review, we just don't have conclusive evidence that compliant flooring prevents fall-related injuries. The existing evidence that we do have is promising, um, but we really need a bit more evidence in this in this regard before we can be certain that uh, that individual types of compliant flooring are are clinically effectiveness. So. At this point, I think the evidence is a little bit immature to strongly recommend installation yet, um, but I think there, there are studies being conducted in this area that will help to address these questions over the next couple of years. Excellent, thank you very much. Uh, one other uh, question that has come in, um, someone has uh, indicated that they're very interested in, in the biomechanical efficacy, efficacy, and they've had some experience with a client who had the, the flooring installed in the bathroom at a care home, and they were having some difficulty with regards to moving the wheelchair afterwards. And so she was asking if there was any information that you can share about this ease of moving wheelchairs. Uh, hi, this is Chantel. Uh, I'd be happy to answer this question. So I did briefly mention uh, some of the records that were included in our study that looked at wheelchairs. Um, however, I do know that of all the records that we've included, they actually were looking specifically at carpet with wheelchairs and not necessarily the, the purpose design compliant flooring that she may be talking about. Um, however, um, the long-term care site that we currently have the randomized controlled trial in, uh, when we are implementing this study, one of their concerns was wheelchairs and maneuvering wheelchairs. And so um, in addition to the ergonomic evaluation I did with floor-based lifts, we're working on analyzing and submitting a, a paper right now um, looking at wheelchairs. Um, and I know that this paper is not published yet, however, I could say that Yes, in fact, um, the forces required to push a wheelchair do in fact increase on uh, certain types of compliant flooring. Um, and as like a pragmatic, uh, I guess, tip or trick, we have uh, noticed that if you were to roll back the wheelchair ever so slightly and then push forward, it does make it substantially easier to push. Um, that may not be the perfect solution. Um, that's just something I personally have experienced. Um, but yeah, stay, stay tuned. Uh, in the next maybe six months or so, there will be another paper out looking at this. That's great. Thank you so much. Uh, this question is for Dr. Mackey. Uh, Dr. Mackey, is your research group working on any ongoing projects related to falls prevention in addition to the ones that you spoke about earlier? Um, the main the main one that we're working on is the the trial uh, in in the long term care home where we will be looking at the impacts of flooring on falls and injuries. Um, in the past, we have um, done a bit of work in the home care context to look at um, different strategies for preventing uh, falls among recipients of home care. Um, but otherwise, there are um, uh, not other specific studies currently that we're doing in the way of um, fall prevention. We really have uh, focused our attention on injury prevention in part because we know that preventing falls, specifically in long-term care, has been an ongoing uh, long-term challenge. And we think that it's useful to supplement efforts to prevent falls with efforts to prevent injuries in the event of falls happening. Excellent. 
Just as a reminder, participants may email your questions at any time to events at caddis.ca. Hi, this is Chantal. I, I guess I could add uh, uh, something to that. Um, so for the flip trial, we're looking at clinical effectiveness, but we're also looking at cost effectiveness. And one of the interesting things that we're excited about is actually costing out falls that are injuries that are not necessarily just hip fractures. So we've been working hard to um, obtain all of the data related to any uh, fall that would happen on compliant flooring or on the control flooring to see how much it would actually cost or, or save um, based on all serious fall related injuries. So not just hip fractures, uh, but all fractures and any injury that were to um, be sent to hospital. Great, thank you so much. So I'd like to uh, give a most gracious thank you again to Dr. Don Mackey and Dr. Chantal Lachant for sharing your expertise with us today. I'd like to also thank uh, our audience participants for joining in our webinar today on the topic, Compliant Flooring to Prevent Fall-Related Injuries. Oh, we have one more question that's come in. Uh, question, you mentioned several types of compliant flooring. Are there types of compliant flooring that are better than others in respect to effectiveness, or are they comparable? Um, this is this is Dawn. Thanks for the question. I'll, I'll take a first stab at this, Chantel, and then you can uh, join in if there's other, other comments that come to mind for you. Um, there, there are uh, a, a few varieties of compliant flooring that have been uh, evaluated um, in biomechanical efficacy studies in controlled laboratory environments. Um, uh, a, a few of the, the different types of compliant flooring perform relatively consistently and that they reduce impact forces by similar amounts. In, in clinical effectiveness studies with human populations, there's still been so few studies um, conducted that we don't have a clear answer to whether one type of flooring is better than the other. Um, there was a, a recent 2017 paper published by a New Zealand research group led by Carl Hanger, and um, this was a study that was done in hospitals uh, or subacute um, health wards for frail older adults uh, involving 20 beds in a, in a New Zealand uh, site. And they uh, installed three of what I think are the most common types of, of compliant floors. So they installed some smart cells flooring. This is 25 millimeters thick or one inch thick. Some Tarket Excel Omnisport uh, floor, which is uh, an eight millimeter thick floor. And then the cradle floor, which is um, a 12 millimeter thick floor. And they didn't analyze their results separately. They, they actually pooled the results across all those three different types of flooring systems. Um, but those are the three that are, are sort of the most commonly available and the ones that are, are being tested, but we don't have evidence yet to say that one is, is any more clinically effective than the other. Chantal, do you have anything to add? Uh, not really. I, I think you touched on um, the most important points. I guess I'm a little bit biased because the only particular flooring I've personally uh, used or tested was smart cell. And I know the biggest draw for us when deciding on a flooring type was that smart cell could actually be installed in resident bedrooms and bathrooms. And bathrooms was key because we know in long-term care at least there's a lot of falls that happen there. Um, and so that was one of the draws. I'm not sure if all of the other flooring types could be installed in the, the bathroom. I know there's a few that can't. So that would be something to consider is maybe the location of the install and then and then go from there. Yeah, and I would also just add to that, like the, the ease of if you are retrofitting an existing facility, um, the, the retrofit installation um, of the smart cells flooring that we have experience with was relatively straightforward. And, and when our trial began, we deemed it to be more straightforward than the other existing types of flooring at that point in time. Um, but that was that was four years ago. So that is just another another consideration is how, how easy it would be to install uh, in an existing building if that's your if that's your intended application. Okay. So we're getting to the uh, towards the end of the webinar. Um, I'd just like to remind participants 
if you have any final questions, to email them to events at caddis.ca. I have another question that uh, came in. Uh, did uh, and this is to both of you. Um, did any studies look at compliant mats, uh, bedside or bathrooms versus flooring? Don't know who wants to start with that. Uh, this is Chantal. I, I can get uh, take it. Um, so for this particular scoping review, we actually did not include bedside mats. And the reason being is that we thought they'd be more programmatic um, type of equipment where it's like removable versus actually compliant flooring based on our definition would actually be installed. Um, so I don't have that available, uh, the information available now, but I know that there has been studies that have looked specifically at fall mats, but I've not, I'm not sure if they've actually directly compared the effects of say a fall mat versus a, a full install of compliant flooring. How about you, Don? Do you know of anything? No, I, I think I think you're right, Chantal. And I would just add that um, one of the things that we are tracking or trying to assess in, in the FLIP study is where in the bedrooms falls have been happening, because I think there's a presumption that they happen near beds, and that's the, the reason for having a, a fall mat near a bed. Um, but uh, it's possible that that that's not the main place where falls are happening. And so the, the fall mat obviously just protects a small area of the floor. Great. So I, I'd like to uh, thank our, our speakers again, Dr. Don Mackey and Dr. Chantal Lachance, and also the audience participants for joining in our webinar today. Please visit uh, www.cadis.com ca for further evidence on this topic and more. This uh, webinar will be archived and will be posted on the CADIS website shortly. If you have any questions about this webinar or CADIS resources in general, please contact your respective jurisdictional CADIS liaison officer by viewing www.cadis.ca.